Hi everyone, Philip Shields here with Light on the Rock. Welcome to our site. In Matthew 25, Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua means Savior, so does Jesus in the English, taught us a parable about the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins who went to meet the bridegroom. And that's in Matthew 25. I'd like you all to be turning there in your own Bibles. Matthew 25, the first 13 verses. I'm going to dwell on verse 5. Now, whether these virgins make up the bride of Christ, the church, or whether these virgins represent also the attendants, or often 10 attendants, to the bride, um, we're not sure. But either way, they all wanted to go into the wedding, and five were foolish, and five were not. And Matthew 25, 13 culminates in a warning that since we don't know the day or the hour of his return, we should be spiritually, not we can't physically stay awake all the time, but spiritually, we need to stay awake, alert, know what's happening. So we're not caught off guard. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, around verse 3 and 4, 5, it says there that you should not be caught off guard. You should not be. And yet Jesus also did say another time to his disciples that I will come at a time you think not. So welcome to Light on the Rock, where we try to have sermons that bring a closer relationship to God our Father and Yeshua, Jesus Christ. The relationship is far more important than a whole bunch of doctrinal things. Far more important. We have hundreds of sermons audio and video, and I want to thank Scott Doucette who put this website together, and I'm going to ask Scott if he could maybe even take a minute or two, if he can, to explain how to use the search bar, and we'll talk about that now real, real fast. It's best to use just one or two words. For example, I have a sermon called Six, uh, Six Reasons to Cherish Your Calling. If you just type in two words, cherish calling. It will come up. Whereas if you try to get the exact uh, title and you miss a word or two, it's going to mess it up. So keep it to a word or two. And then if you scroll down from the home page a little bit, you'll see a section there that Scott will explain more detailed if he wants to and can. How to now look for all the sermons in any particular year, any particular month. So I'll leave it to Scott to address that for a couple of minutes. The Light on the Rock website offers several ways to find an audio sermon, video sermon, or blog. The best way to find content is using the built-in search bar. Just type a keyword like leaven or sin to find relevant content. For the best results, use just one or two keywords. The search will return results that specifically match the exact words you enter. For example, if a user entered the words leaven and sin, the search results would show media content that contained both of those words. If you search for just leaven, you will see more results. If you want to expand your search, use the word or. Searching for leaven or sin will display all content containing either word. Your search results will highlight matching keywords in yellow, making it easy to spot them. Keep in mind, some titles may not show highlights if the keywords are within the body of a blog rather than the title. To narrow your search results, use the advanced search feature. Here, you can filter by content type from the search by type dropdown. Choose Easy Blog to find blogs or sermon media for audio and video sermons. Once you select an option, click Search to update your results. If you want to see everything, just leave it set to search all. You can also browse content by category. From the top menu, click Audio to view all audio sermons, Video for video sermons, or Blogs to view blog entries. You can also focus on a specific time frame. Use the Date filter to select a month and year. This will show all records added during that time. To browse older content, scroll to the bottom of the page and use the page numbers or arrow buttons to navigate. Each page shows 10 records, 
sorted by date with the newest first. Using these tools, finding sermons and blogs is quick and easy. Okay, so let's move on. Yeshua said five of the virgins were wise, five were foolish. So five wise ones took with them some extra oil in case the journey uh, took longer or the time took longer. They wouldn't run out of oil. Their lamps would keep burning. In the weddings back then, it often was at night, apparently, when the uh, attendants of the bride were called to the wedding. And sometimes onlookers would try to join the, the group. And if they didn't have a lamp, uh, they, were, they, they were known as, as being false. They weren't real part of the wedding. And so the five foolish ones whose lamps were running out because they hadn't taken enough oil, uh, we're told, go, go, go buy some more. I can't give you my oil, and I can't give you my Holy Spirit. If you realize close to the end time, Philip, Philip, I, I'm not close enough to God. I haven't been praying. I haven't been working on uh, sins and overcoming. I haven't been studying God's word. I haven't been helping people. I haven't been fighting sin. I can't say, well, here, I'll give you some of my Holy Spirit. Normally that can't happen. Elijah was able to do something like that with Elisha, but normally that can't happen. You have to have that relationship, that oil yourself. So the five foolish had to try to find some after midnight. Eventually they did, but by the time they got to where the wedding was being held, and we'll read all this in a minute, uh, at Yeshua, the king, comes to the door and opens it and says, I don't know you. Who are you? What are you doing here? And he shut the door. They were late. They weren't ready. And they weren't allowed in. Now, Matthew 25, I've pretty much told you the story, but I'll post the scriptures in the notes. For those of you who don't have Bibles, since this goes all around the world, I know you value having them in the notes and on the screen here. So we'll go ahead and post Matthew 25, 1 to 5, as I speak. Kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Many of us went out to meet the bridegroom. In a sense, we really thought 49 or 50 years ago he was coming, and he didn't. It seemed to us like he was delayed. Whether God delayed or not, it seemed to us that he was delayed by our timetables that we tried to impose. Five of them were wise and five foolish. <clears throat> Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil, no extra oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They had these lamps with a cloth wick or something that would come through an opening and that would gather up the oil until it went to the top. That would be lit then it would keep drawing the oil. At some point, they would have to cut some of that off, trim the wick, okay, keep the, the lamp burning bright. So anyway, um, the wise, verse 4, took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They took extra oil. Verse 5, but while Yeshua speaking, Jesus speaking, Jesus himself says here, while the bridegroom was delayed, We're not supposed to be saying the Lord delays his coming, Peter says. But Yeshua here says, while the bridegroom was delayed. They all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered, all ten of them, even the wise ones. If you think you're among these ten virgins somehow, going into the wedding of, of, of the Son of God, this is telling you, that spiritually speaking, all of us right now, including me, are slumbering and sleeping. This is a wake-up call sermon. Matthew 25, 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all, all ten, slumbered and slept. So verse 5 is what this message is all about. It's a wake-up 
wake up everyone kind of a sermon. He said they all slept. We're all found to be asleep as Christ comes. And we wake up in time, the wise ones do, to go meet him. But I want you to ponder what it means to be spiritually asleep. I'll have many verses we'll be reading about that. We are, though physically, obviously, we have to sleep sometimes. Spiritually, we're not supposed to sleep. Spiritually, we're supposed and told in many verses to stay awake, to watch, to be on guard, to be alert. Spiritually, we have to understand the gravity of the times that we're so close to the return of Christ, whether it's two years, five years, ten years, thirty years. In terms of all eternity, that's nothing. That's short. And we don't have time to play, to play with time. So we'll talk more about what happens when you're asleep, what you can't do, what you can do. Verse 5, again, while the bridegroom, Christ, was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now notice a couple of points here as well. They had gone out to meet the bridegroom, verse 2. They had gone out to meet the bridegroom. Many of us, 49, 50 years ago, were expecting Christ to come. They seemed pretty sure of the date, the year, certainly, and the time. Many of us had high expectations. You probably did. Not just in our church group, but in many church groups. Many, many believed. In fact, here just recently, I gave a part two on false prophets. I saw so many YouTube videos being advertised that they took the Hebrew fall holy days, God's holy days, in the fall. One after the other, this means the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, which I don't believe, is taught in the Bible. There's no pre-trib, pre-tribulation rapture, none. I'll give a sermon on it soon. But anyway, they were all saying, it's got to be this month, October 2024. It's got to be on atonement. It's got to be on Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah, as they say. Oh no, it didn't happen then either. So maybe it's happening on the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Maybe it'll happen on the eighth day. Maybe it'll happen at the end of the month. Maybe it'll happen on All Saints Day, November 1, which was Halloween, the eve before over here. They were so desperate, and they were so sure he was coming October 2024. I wasn't part of that. And our church groups weren't part of that. I'm just saying that a lot of people thought, yes, he's coming soon, and he hasn't come yet. There is coming a time, let's turn to Habakkuk 2, verse 3, there's coming a time that it looks like it is delaying. Let's read it. And by the way, as we turn to Habakkuk 3, 2, I mean, chapter 2, verse 3, many, many times Jesus said, in referring to himself, that he left and went back to the far country for a long time. A long time. He says in many places, I'll put in the notes, one is like Matthew 24, 48, and others. And I'll put in the notes. Habakkuk 2, 3. There is a delay in his coming, apparently. It's from our perception, at least. When compared to what everyone's expecting. And so during this delay, we let our guard down. Oh, it didn't happen anyway. We're disappointed. And we start going back to the things that we once rejected. Back to 2, verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Okay, Though it tarries, though it waits, though it delays, tarries. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Or you might say it's not going to tarry forever. Now that's quoted in Hebrews 10, verse 35 to 37. Hebrews 10, verses 35 to 37, where we're also admonished not to give up or to be tired of waiting. 
Now, the five wise virgins made sure they had the extra oil, and you make sure that you have that close relationship with God, with Christ. Now make sure, now wake up. Keep awake on doing this. While the bridegroom delayed, took longer, they couldn't keep their eyes open, they fell asleep, all of them did. Now, there's debate exactly who these virgins represent. Christ is going to marry one bride, one virgin, symbolized as one virgin, all one body, we. Okay, many, many people make up one body, the church. And 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, Paul says, I espoused you to one, to one bridegroom, to one spouse, to Christ, as a chaste virgin. But we can also read in Revelation 14, 4, that 144,000, are called virgins, standing before the throne of God and before the thrones of the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They are in heaven. Revelation 14, 4 makes that very clear. This is after the resurrection, the first resurrection. I really strongly recommend, if you have missed my recent sermons, part one and two on the first resurrection, that you really study those two sermons. For many of you, it will be a real revelation. But one virgin is espoused to Christ, but whether it's one or 144,000, it is like one virgin. We also know from the Bible that many of the weddings had attendants who were attending to the bride, usually around 10. And so these 10 virgins could have also been the attendants to the bride. But either way, they were trying to go to the wedding. The Bible says that those who've been given the Holy Spirit are the church, are the bride of Christ. You can read that for yourself in Ephesians 5.25. Ephesians 5.25 and verse 32. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then verse 32 says, but I'm not talking about you, just, just you husbands and wives. I'm talking about Christ and the church. So those with oil in their lamps are those with the Holy Spirit active in their lives. They have a close relationship with Yeshua, with God the Father. Those who are wise want more than anything else to be able to say, I know him and he knows me. Paul made that his quest. In Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, where he says, all of my past I just look at as a bunch of garbage, dung, waste. I'm not interested in all those accomplishments in the past. There's one thing I cherish. I use this verse a lot, so I'm not going to turn there now, but it's in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11. He says, the one thing I want to do now, my whole goal, is that I may know him, Christ, Yeshua that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Not the resurrection, his. He wanted to have the resurrected life of Christ living again inside of him. As Colossians 3, 3 and 4 says, that Christ who is our life. Okay, We have to put on Christ, other verses say. Paul wanted the life of Jesus to be his own life. Anyway, they all slumbered, they all slept, okay? The very end time church of God or believers are often depicted in less than positive, beautiful ways in the last days. Yeshua in Luke 18, verse 7 and 8 says, But when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith? did not say find the faith. Find faith on the earth. When he returns, he's asking, will people be faithful? And as we read in Matthew 25, 5, they all slept. Those at the very end time are asleep. And then when we come to the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, the last one, first of all, the sixth one, the uh, Philadelphians, uh, Christ says to them, I'm coming quickly. To the seventh one, he says, I'm here. I'm here. I'm knocking at your door. Why is it shut? I'm the door. This is my house. Why have you shut me outside of my own house? 
Again, a not very nice description of end time believers. And they're called lukewarm. So lukewarm that he says, I want to vomit you out of my mouth, spit you out. And he says, I see you miserable, blind, poor, and wretched, naked. In Revelation 3, the last part of the chapter. But you think you're okay. It's no big deal, you say. You think you're rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. Most of you know this passage very well in Revelation 3, uh, verses 14 to 20. Go back and study it. I'll give a whole sermon soon, I hope, on Laodicean, La Laodiceanism, which we don't want to have. Anyway, um, he asked them to get zealous, to repent. And that's what this sermon's doing. Repent and get zealous again. And if we do, he says, he will dine with us. I'll put the scriptures about Revelation 3, 14 to 22 uh, in, the, in the notes. And it, everything I've just said are, are there in those scriptures. And he says to them, in fact, to the Laodiceans, because you're in such miserable state, I want to make sure that I finish what I started in you. So I'm going to have to put you through some severe tribulation, severe trials. So Revelation 3, 18, 17, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That means severe testing. Gold refined in the tire, fire that you may be rich. And you can read the rest from there. He's, and he says, I rebuke and chasten those I love. Repent, be zealous. Verse 19. That's what this sermon's about. That we have to wake up. We don't want to be in an un, we don't want to be an unrepentant Laodicean. We don't want to have someone that he questions if we have any faith. We don't want to be found asleep after he arrives. So it's not a good picture of end time believers, okay, brethren? It's just not. Now, little faith, sleeping, lukewarm, all of that going on. So don't assume, like Laodiceans do, that you're okay. I'll oh, skip this sermon. I don't need to hear the rest of the sermon. I'm awake. Don't Please don't assume that. We are closer to the coming of Christ, of course, than any period of people have ever been, a, as far as closeness goes. We should be wide awake. We should be excited. But many brethren sleep spiritually. Prophesied events are taking place all over the world. There's definite action going on towards building that third temple. There will be a temple, Jesus said, an abomination that causes desolation, abomination of desolation, and will stop the sacrifices and all of that. There will be a third temple built. A lot of preparation has been made for that. I've seen them with my own eyes. I've taken many pictures of it. Uh, the Temple Institute, if those of you aren't familiar with it, look it up, Temple Institute and see what you can find there. The five red heifers that they'll need to purify everything, the ashes of the red heifers are finally there. They're in Israel. The priests are being trained. Jerusalem is being attacked. Israel's being attacked from seven or eight different proxy groups of Iran. China's building up a massive military of Navy and Army and Air Force. And all of this is going on to attack the, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Russia is talking about nuclear war and hypersonic missiles and we are asleep but what are what are we doing what are you doing what am i doing would our king say that you're asleep what happens to someone who's asleep i want to just quickly go through a few points when you're asleep what's happening and what's not happening everyone asleep is inactive now, spiritually, we don't want to be inactive. They aren't doing any work. They're not doing God's work, that's for sure. They're not serving. They're not active. Number two, those who are asleep are not seek seeking to know Christ better. They're not on their knees praying. They're asleep. How can a sleeper be actively following Jesus? Number three, they're certainly not doing God's work on earth at all. They're not sharing the good news with people, their neighbors, their friends. 
Or is that the work only of ordained ministers? It's not. It's for all of us. The early brethren. I want you to read Acts 8 verse 4. After Stephen was persecuted and killed, in Acts 8 they went after all the Christians in Jerusalem. And so many of them fled Jerusalem. And it says in Acts 8 verse 3 and 4, and it says in verse 4 that the early brethren went everywhere. The brethren, not, not the apostles. The apostles remained in Jerusalem. You can read that in the next verse or so. The brethren were the ones who were leaving. And it says everywhere they went, they went preaching the word. The brethren went everywhere preaching the word. I, you, we have to be doing the same thing today. But most of us are not. So they're not doing God's work. Sleepers certainly are not, are, are not fighting sin or Satan as we should. We're letting sinful habits and ways of thinking and lusts and unrighteousness and coveting and anger. All the sinful things, we're letting those happen in our lives without fighting them. We have to resist the devil and he'll flee from us. Satan goes about as a roaring lion, as Peter says. Sleepers are not redeeming the time. They're wasting the time. Making the most of the time. They're not doing that. The most of the time that we have left. Sleepers are not praying constantly. Paul says several places, pray constantly, pray always. I've introduced this concept of constant prayer. And where many, you know, still have your main serious prayer on your knees. Uh, if you can still kneel as you get older, I know that's harder for some of you. Bow your head at least. But if we can kneel, let's kneel. Bow our head and pray first thing in the morning, last thing at night. And then all throughout the day, I recommend many, many, many times a day, just keep talking to God. Even if it's just for 30 seconds or a minute. Praying always. Thanking him for things you see. Praising him. Asking for protection for the, the church. For protection for our leaders. For protection for Netanyahu and the president-elect Trump. Because many people want them dead. So, sleepers are not praying active, uh, actively. They're inactive. And are unaware they're asleep. Someone asleep is not aware he's asleep. So if you think you're not asleep... I'm telling you, you are all slumbered and slept. Now it's time to wake up. So I'll put again the entire Matthew 25, 1 to 13 in my notes. I've read the first five verses already. So let's jump to verse 6. Matthew 25, now verse 6. At midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, fixed them so they would be bright. The foolish said to the wise, uh-oh, we're running out of oil. Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, no, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go rather to those who sell the oil and buy it for yourselves. It's after midnight now. Good luck finding a place to buy oil after midnight. Apparently they were able to, but uh, and then while they went to buy, the bridegroom did come, and those who were ready went in. Those who were ready. Are you ready? I'm not. You're not. Because you're asleep. So right now we all need to wake up. So we can be ready. Those who were ready, the wise ones, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Verse 12, but he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Now, in John 10, Jesus also said that those, my sheep, I know my sheep. And no one can take them out of my hand. I'm not going to lose any of the ones I know. The scary part is assuming Jesus knows you. 
but he might say, I don't know you. So we can't assume that because God knows all things that he knows us. If we're not seeking him and repenting and, and overcoming and resisting sin, fighting the things that are wrong in our I've had to admit the things in my life that just I need I need to face up to and overcome. Certain bad habits and bad ways of thinking, whether it has to do with your marriage or whether it has to do with everyday life or your patience or your fruit of the spirit are you letting those shine in you or not afterwards the other virgin said anyway verse 12 I, I don't know you verse 13 watch stay alert stay awake therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the son of man comes so remember our master promised that he knows his sheep in john 10 i'll read it now John 10, 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice. Are you hearing God? Are you listening to sermons? Are you hearing the Bible in audio or, or, or sermons or, or whatever? Are you hearing what he's saying as you study your Bible? My sheep hear my voice and I know them. Now notice the five foolish. He says, I don't know you. But his sheep, he says, I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Once Jesus knows you, no one can snatch you out of his hand. Take a lot of comfort from that. But like the Laodiceans, he might say, uh oh, you're kind of fooling around there in my hand. I, you're going to have to be like gold refined in the fire, in the trials and tests. So we must know our Savior and know that he knows us. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, says that those who claim to know him but don't keep his commandments are lying. And goes on to say, we have to abide in him and walk as he walked, live like he lived, in other words. Then we can say that we know him. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, I recommend you all read it. You don't want to hear uh, what he says to, remember those in Matthew 7. I've used this many times, Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. But Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we do mighty works in your name? And he will say to them, I never knew you. You workers of iniquity, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. So they weren't among the sheep that are in his hand, the people that are in his hand, who will never be lost from his hand. If he says, I never knew you, he never knew them. So just because someone talks, I can be that way. I can talk well about Jesus and God and all of that and, and myself not know him and him not know me. If I don't wake up and smarten up, if you don't wake up and smarten up, so that's what this sermon's about, smarting up, <laughs> smartening up. Pray that you and I can come to know him. Pray for that. Paul said his greatest goal was that I may know him, Philippians 3, 8 to 11. Work towards that. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 45, that his good servant is out there providing food and so on for the workers. Now Matthew 24, 46 to 51, which we'll post, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Not asleep. When the master comes, will he find you working for him? And you work for him also by working on, even working on yourself, overcoming, resisting, like I said, and helping others and serving others and, and, and all of those things, and being obedient and resisting sin. Will he find you so doing and doing good works for those around you, helping the people, helping neighbors, and so on? Verse 47, uh, Matthew 24, 47. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says to it in his heart, my master is delaying his coming 
and begins to beat his fellow servants. He abuses the other brethren and to eat and drink with the drunkards. So the master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour he's not aware of. Now look at this really tough words Jesus speaks here. Verse 51. And will cut him in two. Did Jesus say that? Yeah. And will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the will appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Are you seeing why I chose this sermon? Frankly, I chose this sermon because I figured I needed it more than all of you even needed it. Now I'm sharing my Bible study with you. This is a wake-up call to me. We'll cut him in two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Are you seeing why we have to wake up? I don't want the door shut in my face. I don't want to hear, I never knew you. I don't want him to say, I don't know you. I don't want him angry with me when he comes. I want to be delighted to know he will be delighted to see me when he comes. I'll read you a verse that says that later on. Romans 13, verses 11 to 14. So now that we're waking up, I hope, I hope what this sermon will do for you is drive you to your knees after you're done hearing it and just repent so deeply of being spiritually asleep. Repent so deeply of sins you've been harboring in your life. Whether it's sexual in nature or alcohol, alcoholism or bad language, we don't talk like Christ would... You know, the way you talk with anyone, would you say it that way and use those words if you were speaking to Jesus? If he was standing right next to you? So whatever the things are that we have to work on, are we coveting, are we unsatisfied with our life? Do we always lust for more? We're always looking for more money. Always, always, always. I know people like that who do that. I'm trying to help them stop it because I don't have money to give to everybody. I give some away, but not, not enough, apparently. I keep asking. Romans 13, 11 to 14. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. So it's not just Yeshua who said it. Paul's saying it to, to the Romans. For now your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Boy, isn't that true? And 2,000 more years have happened since Paul wrote that. We're certainly much closer. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Verse 12, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. Find out in your life what are works of darkness in my life. We all have them. I have them and you have them. Cast off the works of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. Let's walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, even in the church of God, in God's, among God's people. Men are full of lust. And we've got to stop that. A lot of women are too. Most of us men have had to fight that. Probably all of us have. I have. All of us have. Strife. Envy. Stop it, he said. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ like you would a garment. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision for it. So Romans 13 is saying, wake up. Don't be content with your present state of feeling you're okay. You're not. Repent. Be clothed with Christ. Don't be like the Laodiceans who don't realize they were naked. 
They'd taken off the filthy garments, but hadn't put on the righteous garments of Christ, of him himself. The Laodiceans have repented of their sins in the past, but they didn't put on the righteousness of Christ. Hebrews 2 verse 1 gives us another thing to think about. You know how if you're in a boat and if you're not paying attention, maybe you're fishing or whatever, and before long that boat can go drifting off. Someone who's drifting is not aware he's drifting most of the time. Hebrews 2 verse 1 out of the New American Standard for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Not consciously paddling away from it, but because you're not paying close attention, you're drifting away from the ways of God. How many of people who once believed a certain way have now drifted away, are now keeping Christmas, are now not keeping the Sabbath, are now eating anything and everything they want. Because, oh, those are all for the Jews. That's not for us. We were wrong in saying that Saturday is a Sabbath day. No, we weren't wrong. And those of you who've given that up, you're probably not hearing this. But I fear for you. Because you were given these things and walking away from it's very serious. Some of you haven't just, haven't just drifted away, you paddled away from it. Drifting implies something happening to you in your, in your boat that you're not seriously aware of, consciously aware of. Luke, 20, uh, Luke 12, verses 35 to 40 now. Luke 12, 35 to 40. Beware of distractions. Distractions in our life that can make us not keep our eye on the goal. When you watch the World Series, that pitcher cannot be hearing what people are screaming at him from the opposite side. and He's got to be focused on what his job is and what kind of ball he's going to throw and so on. What's keeping you from being wholeheartedly seeking after God and being distracted? Are you spending so much time on social media, reading and sending so many texts that you're running out of time? Is your job using up all your time? Are you working so much over time, that you're ruining your marriage, that you're ruining your relationship, your marriage to Christ, the more important marriage. Are your hobbies using up all your time and, and things you're trying to get going on? I'm not saying hobbies are wrong, but redeem the time, watch it carefully. Luke 12, 35 to 40 in the NIV, be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamps burning, keep them burning. Don't let them go out like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can op immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. Will have, he'll dress himself to be serving them. He will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. What an incredible verse that is, being served by the king of kings. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. Second or third watch of the night is like saying 2 to 6 a.m. 2 a.m., 1 a.m. It's in that period of time. Everyone's asleep. And he says that over and over different ways. So again, he says, I'm coming at a time you don't expect me to. So be on guard. Which means stay awake spiritually, which means cast off the works of darkness. We've all got to do that, brethren. Yeshua then finished the chapter with extremely strong words. You might want to read it yourself. Luke 12, the end of the chapter. And uh, he warns about discerning the times and how we're so close to the return of Messiah. We surely can discern the times we're in. The world is openly talking about potential World War III. Israel being attacked on all sides. Our nation, America, and many others are probably in bankruptcy practically. There may be a big, big stock market bubble uh, burst happening before we know it. And you might lose all your money. 
you might lose all your money. We're going to have to live by faith. You'll have no money. Peace and safety, then sudden destruction, right? Like in the days of Lot. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They're building houses. Everything seemed to be going well. And then overnight, it all changed that fast. Five cities, not just Sodom, but Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Zoar. Zoar was spared. But anyway, therefore let us not sleep. Now let's read 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 3 to 7. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 to 7. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. You have an approximate time when it's going to be, but then bang, the water breaks and there you go. And they shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. We're not supposed to be. So that this day should overtake you as a thief. You're sons of light and of the day. We're not of the night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Not sleep as others do. They all slumbered and slept. No, 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 Paul says. You must not slumber and sleep. Let us watch. Let's be sober. I hope I'm making my point. I want to review some things. We all need to, you need to, I need to wake up from the, being distracted from the things we've been called to, the high calling we have. You might want to hear that sermon, Six Reasons to Cherish Your Calling. Remember, Yeshua said, all the ten virgins slept. That means you and me as well. Now is not high time to be spiritually asleep. Remember, sleeping people are not active. We've got to get active. There, we, can't, uh, be, we won't be considered zealous unless we're active. We won't be repentant if we're sleeping. We'll be lukewarm at best, like Laodiceans. They're not praying like they should. They're not studying like they should. They're inactive. Sleeping people are not spreading the good news to others. They're not active in God's work. They attend church services, but frankly, they're bored and often do other things. While the sermon's being preached, they've heard this one 30 times already. You're bored. I've heard that so many times. Sleepy believers are not fighting sin as they should. They're putting up with bad habits. Oh, that's just me. Get used to it. No, no, no. No. We have to overcome. Sleeping or sleepy people spiritually are not enthusiastic about the things of God. 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, I'll read out of the Holman Bible. 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, instead we're supposed to be doing all we can to make our calling and election sure, as the King James and New King James puts it. Holman puts it a little differently. Uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Confirm your calling. Confirm your election to be part of the elect. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. In this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will be richly supplied to you. It's the kingdom of God, which he then bequeathed to his son, who then bequeaths it to us. It's our kingdom as well. And entrance will be greatly, wonderfully supplied to this wonderful kingdom if we just wake up. And we make sure that our calling and election is sure. Sleepy believers aren't excited anymore about what, what God's doing anymore. Remember the early days of your calling, how exciting it was to hear something new in the Bible that you always had wrong before? To understand where we are in prophecy and what's going to happen? How about now? No, sleepy believers should rather, would rather sleep. Some literally sleep in church. So lay the sins. Many sleepers are frankly bored by all this talk of waking up. They're bored in church. They're bored with their life. They're bored when they pray and fall asleep when they pray. Wake up! We've got to fight that. We've got to change that. Am I describing you? I've described me at times. Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. He offered once to bear the sins. He's the one who bears the sins, not... Satan, that horrible doctrine of atonement that says it's all put on Satan and he takes it. No, no, no. Not a single verse says a single sin ever goes on Satan. 
Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Hebrews 9.28. Now, to my point, to those who eagerly wait for him. Not sleepy wait. Those who eagerly wait for him. You talk about it eagerly with other brethren, other people. You're excited about him. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Wow. He'll appear a second time for those who eagerly. So up to the point of this, that's the point of the message. It's for you and me to wake up spiritually. Make some huge changes in your life. Take a good, fresh look at your spiritual life, where you need to change. Make some notes, private notes. That these are things I'm not going to put up with anymore. I've got to overcome this, 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 and this. You know what your weaknesses are. We all have them. Now face up to them. Wake up. Pray about them. Study how to overcome certain things. If you're constantly depressed, make yourself read Philippians 4.8 over and over. If you have suicidal thoughts, make sure you're not on any medications that can, can cause those. But get back to the promises that God's given you. Get back to positive things. Contact a pastor or minister who can help you get out of those thoughts. So if you're depressed, if you're lustful, if you're lazy, if you're hot-tempered, if you're envious, if you're not happy, face up to these things and wake up. Go to God in prayer. Repent of being a sleepy Christian. Take your steps to be active again. Trim your lamps. Get them ready, burning bright, which means your lives are burning bright. That means cutting, in, cu cutting out all kinds of things that we don't need to be doing anymore. Cut the time on TV. Cut time on social media. Things that are taking you away, are distracting you, letting you drift away. Cut those out. And be ready for the Messiah's return and joyfully receive him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I come before you just ask that you would just hear the short prayer. That We just thank you so much and we lift our hands up in praise to you. We just ask you in Jesus' name that you, Father, will... Help people respond to this sermon. Help me respond to it as well. Help us wake up from this slumber we're in. The end time people got to wake up. Let it begin with me. Let us all say that to you in prayer. Help us to do it. Help us do it, Father. And I pray, dear God in heaven, that you forgive all of us for being so sleepy, for being so lethargic, for being so lukewarm. All of us, me too, all of us. Forgive us, Father. Please forgive us. And please rain down your Holy Spirit on your children. We need it so badly. Please rekindle an excitement in our lives. Oh, Father, please help us look up to you and praise you and love you. And get serious, really serious about our calling. Thank you in Yeshua's mighty name, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.